So for those of you who I haven't met in person, I recognize most of the faces. I'm Joyce Kling, and I'm the current president of TESOL International Association. I'm speaking to you today from Sweden. Uh, I've changed affiliations and I'm now talking to you from Lund, Sweden, and I just am so happy that you're here and I'm so happy that you could all take some time out um, of your schedules and join us for this panel discussion as we talk about and kind of promote uh, our distinguished TESOL Elevate uh, presenters. As most of you know, I think mostly we got some of the presenters here that it's an online two day event that we're going to have in October and it's uh, to help primary and secondary language teachers and professional support their multilingual learners. So uh, I'm going to stop talking and I want to hand this over to our moderator today and this is uh, Grace Martin and Grace is uh, talk, talking to us from Argentina. Grace came onto the board, this is her second year, so she essentially we're in class together. And um, she's currently an academic coordinator at, and, and do I say the word ICANA or is it I-C-A-N-A? ICANA, okay. And her work is focused on English language teacher training and materials development. So Grace, I'm gonna turn it over to you and I'll stop talking and, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. So thank you, Joyce, for your introduction. And hello, everyone from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of the TESOL Board of Directors. And just let you know that, uh, well, as Joyce said, TESOL Elevate Conference will be held uh, virtually on October 18, 19. And it has been designed to help you better support your multilingual learners. So this event will feature workshops led by experts in critical areas uh, of the field, such as student-centered learning, advocacy and social justice, newcomers and students with limited or interrupted formal education, family engagement, and trauma-informed practices. So before we start, let me remind you that we will have five minutes uh, for questions and answers at the very end of the session. So join me in welcoming our panelists today. Uh, um, we have Brenda Custodio, teacher educator from uh, Ohio State University. Jan Dormer, professor of TESOL, Messiah University. Amy Noble, associate professor of special education from Towson University. Judy o Ockling, Language Matters Education Consultants, Patricia Rice Duran, Professor of Special Education, Towson University, Mary Romney, Retired Educator, and Debbie Sirkarian from SirkarianConsulting.com. So let's start with uh, a question. Um, can you tell us? Um, what topic you'll be addressing in your uh, Elevate workshop. Uh, maybe Brenda or Judith can start. Would you like to okay. begin? Yes, uh, Judy and I are Thank going you. to be presenting together and our topic is students with interrupted formal schooling in the K-12 classroom. Uh, so our experience has been in U.S. classrooms, but what we have to say would certainly apply to anyone around the world who is uh, receiving students who are coming into their classes with the interrupted schooling. Thank you, uh, Brenda. Yeah. So what about Patricia and Amy? So um, I can speak a little bit and Amy, please jump in. We'll be talking a little bit about um, identification and assessment of English learners with disabilities, um, particularly on the younger, um, sort of that elementary or early age, um, because it's often challenging to figure out whether a student, for personnel especially, who may not have specialized training in both with fields, it can be really challenging to figure out if a student has a language need or a disability and developmental need or both. And especially in today's world, how those overlap when we have students um, adjusting, going through periods of acculturation, adapting to trauma and things of that nature. Thank yeah, you, Patricia. Thank you. Yes, please you. go ahead. 
sorry to interrupt. Um, no, that's her. Just, just a, I had a tiny bit of a, of an echo for just a moment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so like, like Patty said, it's often hard to identify um, students who may be in the midst of that acculturation mm-hmm. process versus students who do present with disabilities that, that can be documented through a formal process. Um, with the intersection of disability um, and students um, who are ELs is, you know, definitely occurs. There obviously are, are children who um, are learning the language um, who do present with developmental delays, but we have to have um, in, intensive and very detailed assessments in order to determine um, what really is going on. Um, and I think in our presentation, um, I'll talk a little bit more colloquially about my experience um, as a preschool special educator, um, having a number of children who came to me through child find who were identified as having one little guy, for example, was identified as having autism. Um, and the mm-hmm. original assessor was so focused on the fact that he wasn't making eye contact with me. And this was a family who had immigrated from Nigeria. Um, and after learning about um, the Yoruban people and the language that he spoke, his parents said, he's never going to make eye contact with you because you are his superior. You are his teacher. So in our culture, that is not something that's important to us. So I think Patty and I will even talk about some of those nuances. And then we hope to focus on some of the more technical aspects of some of the formal assessments that are currently used for young children. You know, have they been normed? If they're administered to a child whose dominant language is Spanish, have have are they available first of all in Spanish? Have they been normed mm-hmm. on a Spanish speaking population and so forth? So I may have said a little bit too much, but hopefully that'll get people uh, interested. No, that's okay. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jen, would you like to tell us about your workshop? Uh, yes. Uh, So my workshop is entitled New to Newcomers, Welcoming Mm -hmm. and Educating Newly Arrived English Learners or Multilingual Learners. And uh, there are so many different things that could be important areas of focus when we're talking about such a diverse Mm -hmm. group of learners as those who are sometimes referred to as newcomers, those who have been in the country a short time. Um, So there are many different areas that we could focus on, but we are going to hone in on four specific um, Mm -hmm. kinds of uh, needs that many newcomers might have. And one of those is to look at the needs of beginning language learners, Certainly all newcomers are not beginning language learners, but many are. So that is something that we will look at. Cultural adjustment, um, that's a reality for most newcomers. Mm -hmm. Um, Another issue is addressing gaps in academic background. And that kind of goes hand in hand with the SLIFE presentation. But um, some students who are perhaps Uh, not identified specifically as SLIFES, nevertheless may have a few gaps to uh, work through in their um, background uh, as they come into a new schooling system. And then also navigating effects of trauma. So, um, and this certainly doesn't apply to all newcomers, perhaps not even the majority, perhaps maybe not even the majority, but it, it does apply to some. So we are going to talk a little bit about recognizing that, providing supports and things like that. And so in each of those areas, we're going to talk about assessing those needs and we're going to look at what schools can do and what individual teachers can do. Uh, So that's basically an overview of my session on newcomers. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much. Mary? Thank you. Um, The name of my session is From Margins to Mainstream, Incorporating Diverse Englishes into Listening Materials. And I I guess um, I would start by saying that part of the beauty 
of the English language is its rich diversity because it's a world language. It's spoken in so many different ways the world over. Now, as we know, most speakers of English are non-native and world English speakers. Mm -hmm. Yet when we teach listening, there's a tendency to teach only inner circle English. And this marginalizes world English and non-native English. So in my workshop, I share some approaches to the incorporation of authentic materials based on non-native and world Englishes. I believe that incorporating non-native English is very empowering to our students because it reminds them that they are a part of a worldwide English speaking community and that it's the largest worldwide community of English speakers. Because as we know, non-natives are in the, the majority um, mm -hmm. speakers worldwide. So if we're going to prepare our students to engage with the world, um, we might want to consider uh, an inclusive approach to, to teaching listening. So that's, that's what it's about. Thank you very much, Mary. Debbie? Well, hi, everyone. And everyone's workshop sounds so interesting. Um, yes. I'm really excited that you're doing this. Um, let's see. Mine is called uh, Teaching to Strengths, Supporting uh, Trauma-Sensitive Practices with Multilingual Learners. And I'm a um, academic, and I've written a lot in the field. And um, I have my master's in clinical psych, and most of my work was with traumatized youth. So um, the research that I did when I taught at uh, the University of Massachusetts, and then before that, when I worked as an administrator, really led to this lifelong research on what practices are really effective with uh, students that have been impacted by trauma, violence, and chronic stress. So the workshop is going to focus on five research-based strategies that are really important to use with this epic number of, I wanna say growing number of students uh, who've experienced significant and oftentimes multiple adversities. And you know, Thank I you. will add that I wrote a zip guide for TESOL uh, I wrote two of them, and one is on social emotional learning, and a lot that I'll be talking about is based on those TESOL, um, that TESOL zip guide, and um, that was based on the research uh, as well. So I'm excited that this is kind of bringing that into focus. Thank you very much, Debbie, and thank you all uh, for sharing uh, um the topic of your workshops. They are all really interesting. I can't uh, wait uh, to go and attend those workshops. Thank you very much. Now, uh, if you had to uh, share or give a tip um, uh, or, a, or, or an, an idea about your workshop, what would that be? Who would like to start? Can I ask a clarifying question? Do you mean a tip on doing the workshop or a tip on? Yes, a tip, uh, share a tip or idea related to your workshop. So not the content, but the delivery of the workshop? Not the content, but yes, a tip that okay. you would share. Yeah. Anybody? Um, I think I want to speak, but I also wanted Brenda to speak as well. Um, I think one of the tips we would like to share is some things we've been working on about building learner resilience. And um, as part of uh, the concerns for students with interrupted formal education or cypher life students. And um, I hope that um, our participants will take away some of the ideas we have developed over looking at um, some of the early research on building resilience and um, the terminology for, uh, you know, what is resilience of the learner. And, uh, but Brenda has some other stuff that I think that she could add to that. Okay. Yeah, another tip that we want to share is that it's really important that you go back and fill in those academic gaps with the SLIFE students. So we recommend, uh, a basic literacy course in both home language and English, if possible. Um, I worked mainly with middle and high school students, 
and we would have students who would come in with very limited uh, backgrounds in, in literacy. So, you know, your typical middle and high school, even ESL teacher is not used to going back and teaching basic uh, how to mm -hmm. teach reading. So that's one thing that we need to add for our students. And the other thing is a basic numeracy course. Uh, I know when Judy and I do workshops, one of the things that almost always comes up is what do we do with these students who have second grade math skills and the only option for them at high school is algebra. Mm -hmm. And we need some kind of a, a course that builds from where they are to where they need to be in order to catch up to their peers. And many schools don't offer that. And we need some kind of a, a gap measure for those students. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add to that, too, as having worked in elementary uh, from K to eight, um, kind of overlapping in middle school, um, I was never prepared to teach reading. I was prepared to teach English and learning language. And um, so I think all, all across the board, teaching how to read and how to read in English and how to understand what you read um, is really key for the students that we work with. And, um, you know, it's a big eye opener for me to learn how to teach reading. I knew how to read. Mm -hmm. I helped my kids learn how to read. But to teach reading to SIFE students was a, a real mm -hmm. learning gap for me as well. And I took from that to teaching you know, what I learned about learning to teaching those mm -hmm. students. Thank you. I will, Thank you. I will piggyback oh. on that. Yes. <laughs> because Go what ahead. I have to say kind of relates to that a little bit too. Um, a tip that I uh, would hope that people would remember from my session is the importance of individualizing instruction for newcomers. Um, the importance of assessing on in multiple forms that you know, just one um, standardized language assessment is not sufficient. A lot more data needs to be gathered uh, about newcomer um, students. And then once that data is all compiled and once the information has been gathered, um, schools really need to think about individualized placements. Students need individualized programs um, that will place them in the best places for their learning and content, mm -hmm. ESL supports or ELD supports um, and in multiple levels in multiple ways. So um, a key takeaway for mine is the individualization um, okay. that is required to meet the needs of newcomer students. Thanks for that. Um, Mary, maybe, or someone else? Mary, would you like to share the tips? Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, I guess, um, I think it's quite important for teachers and students to understand something about the worldwide demographics of the English language. I think, uh, you know, there's a tendency for people the world over to think that, um, uh, the inner circle is the kind of the center of the English speaking world. Um, even if that's true, it's only for economic and political reasons, not linguistic ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't, or most people, I would say, don't really think about some of the major English speaking regions of the world when they think about the English language. For example, the Anglophone Caribbean. It's very difficult to find materials that include the Anglophone Caribbean, which has exerted a major cultural influence over the rest of the world. Yet, um, it's uh, and the Anglophone Caribbean is not even represented in the TESOL Association where the affiliate structure is concerned. Uh, so I, I, I think it's it's very important for us to to try to think globally, try to think of English on a worldwide basis. Um, another example would be um, the Anglophone countries of Africa, um, which again have huge English speaking populations. Um, just Nigeria alone has more English speakers than the entire population of the United Kingdom. Uh, it has the world's largest um, uh, cinema industry, 
the largest movie industry in the entire world, which is a largely English speaking, um, which issues a largely English speaking product. I'll say it that way. So, um, but, but you don't see um, these areas of the world being represented in the materials or um, even um, on the radar, <laughs> I'll say, of um, the, the English, English language teaching community um, outside of, of perhaps those countries. So I think um, it's important to, to have an understanding of the worldwide demographics of the English language. That, that has been a, an area of interest for me for, for many years. Um, and as such, I've tried to, or not tried, I have actually uh, incorporated um, a lot of those Englishes in my teaching. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, Debbie? Okay, so I, I can give you some tips on how I do the workshop, which is why I Good. asked that question. So um, what I try and do in every uh, this every session I do is engage participants in what I hope that they'll use in their practice. So the uh, session will be research-based, but it will also be quite personal to help us in building relationships with each other, to help us in seeing... Uh, how we should be connecting the curriculum to students' lives in a positive way. And that's going to lead to a discussion of why the move from deficit to asset based and what that looks like in practice. And the entire workshop will be based on a routine. So at the end of the workshop, we'll be looking at what routines we use during the workshop and why those routines were so important. So I'll likely introduce the session by we're going to do this. And then I'll have shifting transitions to make the transition because that's very important with traumatized uh, students, adults, whomever we work with. And then uh, the session will be interactive. And I don't know what that means because it'll depend on how many you tell us are attending. Um, but a big aspect of helping traumatized youth is learning how to collaborate. So we'll be looking closely at those four elements, building relationships connecting the curriculum to our lives, uh, providing reassuring classroom routines and uh, collaborating with others. And those four are what the research on traumatized individuals, both the psychiatric uh, research in psych uh, psychiatry, psychology, social work, and education show as the most critical elements of uh, using trauma-informed practices. So I wanna make the session personal so people will experience that themselves and be able to draw from it in their own work. Thank you, Debbie. Um, anybody, any any other tip that you would like to share? I'll chime in. Okay. Um, so I think similar to, to Debbie's line of thinking, when I originally heard your question, I interpreted that as um, a, a tip for, to, for participants to um, better make meaning of the presentation. So right. the tip I would share uh, for the session that Patty and I are leading is to perhaps think of a time, think of a situation, um, think of an assessment scenario where you were part of a team um, assessing a student, where now in retrospect, you feel like maybe we missed a component or gosh, I wish I had known you know, then or, or thought to ask, right? Because a lot of times we, we don't know what we don't know. You know, is there um, a receptive, a test of receptive language that has been normed in Urdu um, or has been normed in, and I'm saying this because I know there are many and we'll probably present one of these, normed in Spanish. So if the participants could, could come uh, with a willingness to reflect on experiences like that, I think that would help us engage them better and um, make the most time of our of our work together. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, I think it's now time for questions from the audience. Um, okay, we have a question from Linda, uh, a participant. Um, it says, sorry. I'm an ELL teacher, many who are monolingual Spanish speakers. I use Google Translate, but it's not great. 
most are in high school, but their reading level is their level, their reading level, sorry, is first grade. Tops probably third grade. Any suggestions for her? Well, I think it goes back to what we mentioned a little bit earlier that we need some kind of, first of all, training for ESL teachers and how to teach reading um, to all children who come in who aren't at grade level. And, you know, the idea of using Google Translate, I mean, that does get you through on an emergency basis, but, uh, you know, we have to start if, if there's bilingual training, that would be ideal. If not, you just need to start the typical ESL with uh, basic vocabulary, working your way up to you know, more advanced. But it's really difficult when they come in at high school level. That's what I worked with. And it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge. And if you don't have some kind of a, uh, a program in place for these students, each teacher is struggling on their own to come up with answers. And, and I'm sure Jan is going to talk about the same kind of thing that, you know, we, we recommend newcomer programs when possible, um, even if it's just one period a day for students that, that get some kind of assistance with building their English, but also with survival with the, in their other classes. So. Right, and we also talk about um, in some of the work that we do, and we've just done some things for a, a group in Rwanda about using translanguaging. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of people at TESOL who've been talking about translanguaging for the past few years. Mm -hmm. And um, so how you um, use an, an assets-based approach for their use of their own native language for communicating with, you know, and thinking about what they're learning and then being able to then apply it to using even rudimentary English or English with sentence starters or uh, paragraphs with gaps in it for vocabulary, et cetera, so that uh, they're moving to not give up their native language, but to use it to the best advantage that they can um, in, in the situations that they're learning. And Brenda's right, they really do need a program. And we need to work with other teachers in the building to understand their they're really specific needs and not to have expectations beyond what they can do, but to offer ideas for what can be done in their content classrooms. And a lot of the times we also talk about um, teaching thematically so that we are um, mm -hmm. addressing learning language, but also learning content because if they're in middle school or high school, you can't just focus on learning vocabulary. Sorry, I gotta I'll mute my text. I'll jump in as well. And I think as Brenda and Judith had said, um, it's a really, you know, important thing to figure out exactly what's going on with this student. I think the um, question that Linda raised also raises a question in turn, which is that student's reading level, is that um, a native language? Is that a Spanish reading level? Or is that an English reading level? Because those both need to be addressed, but they need to be addressed in very different ways. Um, and possibly you may involve different personnel. If you have a student who's in high school, um, but reading at a first grade level in Spanish and English, that's a very different problem from a student who's in high school, who's still reading at a first grade level in Spanish or in English, but who's, you know, closer to grade level in Spanish. But I absolutely agree too, as Judith said, I think collaboration and advocacy is a really important part of this piece, working with your reading specialist, if you have access to one, working with your gen ed teacher, finding out what reading programs are available for reading instruction for this student, because this is really, when we think about equity, um, this is you know sort of what equity looks like in practice. You have a student who has you know two, three more years in our educational system and we need to ensure that they are as ready as they can be for higher education or career. And literacy is really a part of that. So thinking about some of those strategies that have been suggested um, and then advocating and collaborating with your team to figure out what the student needs and the most effective way to deliver that um, is sort of the direction I would recommend. Yep. It, to me, it's as much as what we've shared. It's also what, who is the student? What's their experience? and why are we looking at it through a deficit-based lens of what they can't do in English? 
because certainly that students had many years of existing on this earth, literally, and has had many, many experiences that will be hopefully acknowledged, valued, and so forth in his classroom. But that only happens when we think using an approach that really taps into who the student is, what their prior experiences are, and so forth. And an example of it is I worked for years with kids with uh, limited prior schooling because of have uh, going through uh, civil crisis, war, and so on and so forth. And I did the same thing. I would say, well, they only read at this level. But once I got into the asset-based mindset of what students were able to do and could do, it changed the focus tremendously. Like a student who I worked with uh, many years ago, who was the ticket, he worked on his uncle's bus when he was a little boy for years and he collected money and exchanged, uh, was a ticket taker and he exchanged money. And I remember his math teacher saying, he knows nothing about math, he's probably at a first grade level. And yet when we found out about his background, he knew a lot about math. So I think the question uh, might be, he speaks Spanish, just like our colleague just said. Has he had literacy experiences in Spanish? What is uh, what uh, sources do we have that speak Spanish that can really help us in learning as much as we can about him and other students who speak Spanish? Are there peers that we can buddy him up with uh, so we, that we can keep on learning more about uh, the student? And I would say that all of these American-based tests that we might apply that really tap into what he's able to do in English will never get us to... Um, what he what he really knows and is able to do. So the more we tap into his home language and find out from him and his family about him, we have, we have a much better chance of helping him be successful in whatever school he's attending. So the Spanish that he speaks has to be part of our asset-based approach, as does asking questions that really highlight his uh, many, many strengths and assets. That that goes back to the broad view of assessment that needs to um, take place, uh, assessing through interviews and um, just mm -hmm. lots more than just um, a standardized uh, language proficiency oh, yeah. test, for example. Yeah. You know, and I want to add to that too. Thanks, Jen. Um, that um, I worked in a low incidence school, and I always heard from all the teachers indicating, well, he doesn't know and he can't do. And there was never mm -hmm. an idea of, well, you know, I know what he can do. Can we talk about what he can do and what he can bring to his learning? Because once a mainstream teacher has very little, uh, interaction with English language learners in the situation that I worked in, because I was the only ESL teacher in a K to eight setting, was that you have to know what he can do and what he's capable of doing and not waiting till months and months till you find that out. Let's talk about that now and bring that to, um, you know, to understanding how you can tap into what he can do so that he can then learn. Thank you. Uh, Mary, just, do you have one last comment for us? Just very quickly, I, I want yes. to say everything that Debbie just said and a lot of what Judith just said reminds me of culturally sustaining pedagogies. Absolutely, yeah. I feel that um, th that's part of why I, I like to include non-native Englishes because it validates a lot of the, the, the countries and cultures and, and, and ways of thinking that the students come from. Okay. Great. Uh, well, this has just been fantastic, uh, and it's just a sample of of why thirty minutes is never long enough for us to get together to really get going on a topic. Thank you so much for this taster. Uh, this is evidence of how exciting this event is going to be. I hope that many of our uh, people attending today will be able to attend the event and tell your colleagues about this. There's information for registration online, and there's also information out in the various social media platforms. Thank you, Grace, for uh, moderating our panel today, and thank you to the panelists. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.